Hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to share um, these chairs with Christian Le Boutin. Um, I've um, had the opportunity of working with Christian for over a decade. And during that time, I've come to know him, have some amazing times with him, to admire him. Like many women in this room and around the world, I share a passion for his shoes, but I also share a passion for him as a man. Um, he is irresistible, and as you will get to see when you hear him talk tonight, which is why when he called me a few months ago and said, oh, Nathalie, uh, I'd like you to come talk with me at uh, the v um, I couldn't say no. Um, although I explained to him that I don't do this sort of thing, um, this is, I'm actually not very comfortable speaking in public. And he said, oh, don't worry, it'll be fun, just go for it, we'll do it together. And I said, okay. And then he admitted to me that actually his first choice couldn't do it, and everyone else had said no. And uh, so anyway, here we are, all of us together, talking to Christian. Um, the reason why this is all happening is because um, uh, we are marking a momentous occasion in his career and in his life. On November 21st, 1991, Christian, uh, age 27, opened his very first store and started designing his collection of shoes and selling them to fashionable women around the world. 20 years later, fueled by a passion for high heels and for what I believe is one of the most admirable goals a man can have, which is to long to make women more beautiful, more sexy, make their legs look as long as possibly can be, he is now sitting at the helm of the most successful shoe company in the world and has become as famous as the Red Souls for which his shoes are known. So I would like to introduce you to you, my friend and the man who we love to make our shoes, Christian Louboutin. She I'm says she's not comfortable, but I am not comfortable neither, so it's going to be the two of us. <laughs> um, so I asked that they put the house lights up so that it felt more like a conversation of all of us in the living room. So pretend that you're at a dinner party with us and we're all drinking champagne and chatting. Um, so I don't know how many of you know, but um, if you were to advise somebody on a career move, you probably wouldn't use Christian's past as a recipe for success. Um, Christian, um, you um, had no formal training. You were expelled from four schools. Um, three, three. Three schools? Okay, only three. Okay, three, well, three, three, yeah. um, you ran away from home at 12 to live somewhere? 12 and a half. 12 and a half. You became a punk. Um, you danced all night, slept all day, dabbled in gardening. Um, <laughs> Um, and then you developed this obsession for showgirls and burlesque clubs. Um, Christian, do you believe in destiny? Mm, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's amazing well, that you came, you are where you are today. I don't know if I believe in destiny, but I, I've been knowing that I really love shoes for a very early age, that's for sure. Did you know you were going to be this successful? When you were a child, did you feel that you were destined for something great? No, because first of all, when I started to draw shoes, it was at school. Um, I was very lazy at school, and I thought it was a good way. I was lazy. I was a lazy child, but I was quite mature. And uh, what happened is that when you're a child, you have all those people coming to you and saying, so what do you want to do when you're going to be a big person, etc., an adult? And I was thinking, and I, one of my best friends at school was completely traumatized by that question, and she was saying, what can I say? You know, I don't know what to say. I said, just say anything. And she said, no, 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 no. I said, a oh, cook. She said, no, I don't like to cook. I said, anything, it doesn't really matter. But I realized that it's quite traumatizing to not to know what you want to do when you're a child, because you have the pressure of people asking you for so stupid thing. You know, when you're 12, you don't know what you want to do. And you can change a million times anyway. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough that I liked shoes. So I was saying, I will draw shoes, not thinking that it was actually a real job. 
you know. So I was basically lying, thinking, you know, I can always say that because I like to draw shoes, but I never really understood. I did not understand age 12 that it was actually. But I think that's an, an important thing, is that the fact that you turned what you love to do into your career. And they always say that if people do what they love and they are true to themselves, then success will follow. So really, I think you're an inspiration for that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people would have said, um, you know, you're crazy to do that. T tell me about your mother, Irene. Um, it sounds, you, you were brought up in a household of women mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, your father was a bit absent, but she sounded like an extraordinary woman. What was her influence on you? Well, the influence that she had is that she really let, my, uh, she let me to be completely free. She had no judgment about people in general. She was a very, very, very nice person. Was and she very beautiful? Sweet. She was beautiful. She was beautiful. Did she wear beautiful shoes? No, she was absolutely not into <laughs> shoes. And the fact is, is that I do not remember the shoes of my mother. So really my mother, the biggest influence of my mother is really that she really thought that people should be brought up in the easiest way through love. That's an important thing. And I think that when you basically have love as a child, you know, it gives you a huge spin. Yeah. I don't know if you say that, spin, in a spin dorsal. And, oh, spine. Uh, a spine, yeah. spine. Yeah. And so this is what she really gave me, the freedom to, to think the way I wanted. She never put any limits on you. Apparently she let you um, come in with your friends and spend the night in the house. Yes, the, the, very the, young. The, the weird thing I realized, because when you're a child, you think that every parent is the same, more or less. You, know, you don't think, you never think as a child that you have a special childhood, which I never thought I had. I realized when I was 16 or 17, even before, that I had a, not a weird childhood at all, um, but I had a, 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 quite a special mother in the sense of, for instance, when I was coming back from clubs around 13 or 14, if I was coming back with someone, which happened often, well, she would, during the weekend, as my father was not there, she would just leave her bed, I mean, my parents' bed, because it was a bigger bed. And I remember people saying, we're sleeping in the bed of your mother. It's amazing. She... So, yeah, it's the biggest bed, you know. And, she... I mean, she treated you like an adult from a very early age. I mean, it sounds like you had an amazing amount of freedom. Um, looking back now, are, are, are you, um, you, you say things like, I don't know how to be unhappy. Um, do you think that this attitude is part of your success? Well, I think that if you, I mean, that's, that's completely personal. I mean, people can think the opposite, so, but for me, it's very important to be happy, also for my work. Number one, it's a sort of natural element that I have, but also for my work, I just don't like design in the fashion thing. I don't like design when it's really built through unhappiness. You know, it looks, I mean, it everything which is sad doesn't make me happy. I mean, it's, it's a bit stupid to say, but. Well, I think that you know, designing is a great thing, but it's one of the great things of designing is to bring some happiness. If it's just to bring you know, bitterness and sadness, etc., you, know, you have other job to do. I, I, mean, I think do. the thing that struck me and my team when we come visit your collections every season is um, the exuberance and the joie de vivre, which a lot of people describe about you. And um, you walk into his showroom, and it's just this sea of designs and everything is just vying for your attention. Um, you go visit a lot of other shoe designers' showrooms and um, it's very controlled and it's very stark and, um, and no wonder women love your shoes because somehow they're channeling this joy of life that you have. Did you, have you seen L'Amour Fou? The, no, um, this is the new film that's out uh, about Yves Saint Laurent. No, no, and, not yet. Um, of Pierre, right? Pierre Berger talks about mm -hmm. how tortured Saint Laurent was with his success and um, how actually through his shyness and his insecurity, the fame really made him suffer. And you don't seem that tortured about your fame and success. But number one, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Yves Saint Laurent. You know. I, I, I think that you are. Christian, you have become, you've put shoes on the map worldwide. Um, I think that there are people out there who cannot afford your shoes, who um, know you on a first name basis. Um, obviously, we get the random pronunciations of Le Boutin, um, which is Le Boutin. Um, but no, I think uh, you really have, you're on the world stage, Christian. 
But, you know, there is also one thing that I have never... Number one, I never wanted to become a designer. I never had this idea. I never projected myself in a long terms, in a way. And in terms of work, I basically, I've been designing shoes before doing my own shoes. I've been designing shoes for people. And then, age 27, I sort of by accident started my company, meaning I was, reality is that I was trying to buy a lamp in this gallery where I had the store. And the person wouldn't sell that lamp, so I was coming back and forth trying to buy that stupid lamp, which I have now. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. And um, so he was trying to get rid of me, and he said, what about your shoes? And I had stopped designing shoes two years before that, and I started to learn landscaping. So he said, why are you not into shoes anymore and landscaping? I said, well, you know, it's been a child dream, but one point you sort of have to question yourself if you have to leave for your child's dream or if you become an adult, maybe you want to change. So I don't want to be, does one have to be always faithful to your own childhood? I don't know. And the answer is probably no for me. And he said, but do you, do you regret it? I say, actually, yes, I do because I'm not very patient and you need patience to be a landscaper. And <laughs> I said, well, you know, to see those things growing from this to that in one year, it's driving me crazy. So I sort of regret the shoes. You would have ended up with, like, the highest hydrangeas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so I, he says, so why don't you keep on? I said, well, I never thought about it. He said, why don't you do your own thing? And he said, listen, instead of annoying me here, just go at the end of the, at the corner. There is a shop. Why don't you take it? I say, oh, I didn't think about it. Are you sure about the lamp? And uh, so, I ended up, <laughs> so you did so, it just to get the lamp? Again? Yeah. No, 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 no. And uh, so I went there and I thought, well, it's actually an idea. And so two or three days after, I visited the place which I liked. And so two or three days after, I had dinner with my two best friends, older friends, and uh, I spoke about it. And he, one of them said, why don't we do the thing? Let's do it together. And like this, voila, you do the things that you always loved. And so it just happened this way. So it almost happened by accident. Yeah, but great that you had people around you to push you in that direction. Yes, yes. I'm very grateful to them. And also, it's been 20 years now that we've been working together. I mean, one doesn't really work with me, That's but amazing. the other one is working. And we still are very, very good friends, which means that you, know, you hear a lot that if you have friends, never work with them. Yeah. I am the living proof of the opposite. You know, you can definitely work with friends. Good. Yeah, good. Very good. <laughs> well, we're here together. <laughs> um, I want to talk about shoes. Um, so you have said um, that um, shoes are more interesting for their psychological properties than their physical properties, um, and that a shoe has so much more to offer than just to walk. Um, you, you, you see meaning in shoes. Um, Yes, I think that, of course, I think that shoes are very important, but also, how can I say, um, shoes is bringing postures to the entire body, and shoes is really transforming the way you walk, the way you act, the way you stand, etc. So it's definitely a very important element, especially for women. I mean, I'm talking women's shoes at this point. And, um, so, what is the question again? <laughs> you see, um, you see more in uh, in shoes. I mean, for example, yeah. what do these shoes say to you? You said that you can um, do. A, uh, it's almost like a Rorschach test. Um, you don't want to share that with everyone. <laughs> I'd better not say it. <laughs> no, uh, but, they're you know, your the, shoes. The, um, <laughs> Yeah, you're the girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's the favorite shoe that you've ever done? I'm sure every girl in the room here has their favorite Louboutin shoe, but what's your favorite shoe? You know, it's complicated for me to say which is my favorite shoe, and um, because when you're designing, there are two things which are sort of separate. There is one pleasure, which is a graphic pleasure, which is a design pleasure, but also of a when I'm designing things, there is that pleasure, you know, to the, the, the architectural element, the drawing, basically, the graphism, the style, basically. But also, for me, my shoes also remind me of situations, people, situa 
situation already said it. Yeah. So said it twice. people, situations, um, things. So you're not so, you're not going to so name you know, a favorite. Some Apparently, parents have favorite children. So you even this is on the cover it's, of the National Geographic. Um, and um, wait, it's complicated. Is, because is there one in a fire that you would run and rescue? I would. <laughs> A pair, at least. A, a pair. pair. A pair, a pair, yes. No, what I would say is that um, if there was one shoe which would remain, I would say it would, I would say a pump. Okay. And the reason is when you're designing shoes, when I'm designing shoes, the most important thing is really the bone structure. A shoe, a pump, is basically a face with no makeup. So, a face with no makeup can be even better maybe with makeup, but if the face is beautiful, it's, it's great. Any type of makeup is going to be okay in general. You know, it's difficult to destroy a perfect face in a way. So a pump is representing, it's basically the whole silhouette. It's a heel, it's a front, and it's an arch. So it really is like the bone structure yeah. of, a, of a face. So once you have, if you have a good pump, you can, then after the rest is makeup, you know, you can put colors, you can put things, etc. But again, you know, the same, if you have a bad pump, if you have a bad bone structure, you can put anything. It's just like masking thing, but at the end, it's never really that great. So and what's your favorite heel height on a woman? And no high heel high enough, I have to say. No. So, uh, <laughs> it's like a song. The next is it. Hey, no <laughs> high heel high yeah. enough. <laughs> Nothing can reach it. Yeah. Well, over um, what, so what was your most successful shoe? What has um, sold the most? Um, I, would, I would start by one, which basically uh, how do you say, saved my ass basically, yeah. <laughs> which is the first shoe that I did called Love. So it's a flat shoe and it's, it made part of those drawings that I did which I call the Love Birds, meaning the drawing is complete when you have the two feet together. It's one graphism once you join the two feet, just like the Love Birds, which are those animals, little birds, and if one dies, the other one dies immediately. They cannot be separated. So I was drawing all those lovebirds, this little lovebird collection basically. So the first one was like this and was love, but if you were opening, you wouldn't really see the L and O and the V and the E. It was sort of, and it's the first shoes that I did, the first collection. And I did a photograph of it and I had this friend who was working a little bit in fashion. He said, well, you know, if you have a shop, so you have to send a picture and explaining that you're a new designer ta -ta 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 -ta, to, to the French press as I'm, I started in, in Paris, and so, which I did with that picture. So basically people would come for that picture, for that shoe, and I only sold that pair of shoes the first season. But that's what set you. And uh, it was upsetting because especially I was selling in the store and I was saying, you know, we have other shoes, look at the golden <laughs> heel, it's very pretty. That's the one everybody the wanted. Same, Everyone wanted that shoe, but so I started to have a love and hate relationship with that shoe. But it basically has been the most Did important. Did you ever shoe. do a hate shoe? No. No. no, 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 no Only no. love with Christian. Um, so I read in researching you, Monsieur Louboutin, um, about shoes. Um, and they say that in 2008, in a cave in Armenia, scientists discovered what is thought to be the world's oldest leather shoe. It was a woman's size seven and it had laces and straw padding. Laces um, and straw, straw padding. padding. Um, now, if scientists were to discover a pair of Christian Louboutin shoes in 3008, what would they think about us in society? Well, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know how they are going to be in 3008, so it really depends what they look like in 3008, but definitely they would think that it's a tiny heel. I'm pretty sure that tiny it's, heel. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to keep well. You know, if the feet gets bigger, the heel is going. Are to the get feet bigger. getting bigger? Yes, of course. Oh my of God! Course. No, no, the feet get bigger. Happy to I'm be alive. I'm actually pretty impressed that it's a size seven that has been found a million years ago. Yeah, yeah. She had a big foot. <laughs> size seven English or size seven? Uh, the scientists didn't specify. <laughs> 
Um, you're obsessed with women, um, and obviously one of the reasons why we get along is that I'm a girl. Um, but you, you, you do think a lot about women, and you're surrounded by women, a lot of your best friends are women. So I'm going to ask you some questions about women. Mm -hmm. um, for you, who is the sexiest woman alive? Oh my God. Who inspires you? Well, a lot of women are inspiring. But um, I can't answer that question. You get in, you'll get in trouble with all of your <laughs> girlfriends. It's a very smart move. If you could have been a woman. Well, I would be on high heels, that's <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, you once said you'd like to design shoes for the Queen of England. What kind of shoes would you like to see her in? Well, I mean, I've been asked who, who would be the person that I haven't designed shoes for that I would like to have. And I thought the Queen of England because I think that the Queen of England is actually not really a woman. She's a symbol. Yeah. So it would be a challenge because if you're designing for an icon or for a symbol, you actually have to respect some things, some rules, some laws, etc. So it will so be a challenge. Would you do a low heel for her? Well, I, it would depend on her, you know. It depends what she wants to do. With Has she shoe. ever asked you to do any shoes? No. No? <laughs> I can't believe it. It's ridiculous. Um, so if I say to you, Caroline de Monaco, mm -hmm. what, are you, what's, what does she mean to you? She means a lot because she's been my second fairy, I would say. Fairy in fe? Yeah. Okay. Fairy, yeah. like fairy godmother. She actually brought me uh, good luck, you say? Yeah. Because uh, Caroline came, I didn't know her, she came in the store very, very early. Uh, I opened my first store so in November 91 and she came in December. And then she came back and one day she was coming, there was this journalist, American journalist who was coming to do um, a little paper on new shops. So she, when she entered, she saw Princess Caroline which is a big deal in France. And how did she know about you? She knew because I just opened a shop and she was working for W Magazine and they were it's doing a, a thing on new shops. So she was coming to, you know, to ask me three questions about the things there. So when she saw Caroline, she was like, oh my God, it's crazy. This thought just arrived, etc. And they already have very high profile clients, etc. So she wrote this article and immediately it brought me buyers. But again, I was really not ready for that. So when the buyers arrived, it was in March, 92, and they were coming to buy the winter collection. But I had a bit of the summer collection. I, I was not prepared to, I was not ahead as you do, meaning you, you show a collection six months ahead, etc. So they asked about the winter collection. I said, I don't have a winter collection, but look at the summer. They said, no, but the summer <laughs> is not now. It's, it's for sale now. They say, what about? this, it could be a bit winter. I said, but this is the old winter, you know, 91 winter. Yeah. I said, but nobody knows you, who cares? Yeah. Yeah. I said, still, still it's an old collection. They said, nobody I've ever, has ever heard of you, so it's not a big deal, please, let us buy it. So I thought, well, I guess I have so to you do did? that. I did, yes. It's a good idea. But it helped yeah. me, actually. Take advantage it, of the opportunity. It helped me because I already had the patterns, etc. so it was yeah. sort of easy to reproduce. But I felt that I was betraying myself or not. Oh, it's okay. I'm sure they were great I shoes. I survived. I mean, in your catalog of shoes, I'm sure that um, we could go back right now and pick some uh, styles from that first collection and it would be completely relevant for today. I read that you are, um, you don't work uh, to the fashion cycles, You're, you, you don't consider what you do fashion? Well, the thing is that um, I never wanted to work for fashion. I really, I was always into shoes and it happened that shoes has to see with fashion, so I ended up working for fashion. But the real thing, so my real drive at the beginning was to work for showgirls. And um, so I was born and raised in Paris. And you have the theaters where you have yeah. like a music hall, and, but also the plays, etc. I was with my best friend from school. When I was 13, 14, we had realized that you often have intermission, you know, to act. So first act, you're there, and second, between, at the end of the first act, people go outside, smoke cigarettes, and come back and change seats, you know, that type of thing. And nobody ever asked for the ticket in Paris. I don't know about here, but nobody asked the ticket for the second act. So we ended up sneaking always to the second act. 
and never seeing the first act. We couldn't afford it, but we saw every second act of everything in Paris possible. <laughs> and so when I was sort of aware and completely waken up, we would see serious plays. And it was actually very interesting because you enter and you've been, you haven't seen the first act and you, sometimes we didn't know about the play at all, but you actually understand through the audience looking at people, I mean looking at the play, but also through the audience because someone enters, for instance, on stage and everybody's like, you feel, people are scared, so you say, okay, this is a nasty person in the play. Or people start laughing, you think, okay, this is a nice character, we are going to love this one, etc. So you sort of understand without understanding. I love so that it, they, it makes you, your brain go very, very the quickly. The Folie Berger have been such a um, university for you on so many levels. Yes, so basically when we were fed up to see plays that we could not understand, we would go to see musical because then, you know, you don't yeah. have acts, it's very easy to understand. And uh, so it was an easier way to relax. And um, so because of that, I've been seeing all the shows in Paris and also I was really an expert, I became an expert in the Folie Berger and so I knew all the name of the girls etc. So really my thing was to design shoes for showgirls, for musical. And, uh, and did you ever think that you would do a fashion collection? No, no. I really wanted to, first of all I had Look at you, for instance. You know, you're almost like a showgirl. And uh, <laughs> the first was a thing. And as a teenager, when I was looking at those girls, I was seeing birds. I was seeing birds of paradise or exotic birds. So, looking at these girls, I thought, what could I do for them? And I had not realized that they were wearing costumes. You know, for me, every bird this has fur. You know, if you're a bird, you have fur. So the only element which is not natural to a bird is high heels, you know. So I thought, well, those birds have high heels which are designed by someone. So I want to design the shoes for those exotic birds. So really, I concentrated on that. And it's only when, so I, then when I was, I became an intern when I was 17 to the Folie Berger and I stayed a few months there. And then, of course, you know, it's a very complicated thing to design shoes and it's an expensive thing. So. Paris not being Broadway, you know, they redo really things, you clues, but I mean, I couldn't really design there. So after a moment, I sort of realized that I would probably never do shoes for showgirls if I was staying at the Folie Berger, you know, helping everybody. I'm sure to they're get all together. wearing your shoes now, though. Well, I'm. <laughs> so if business is good. I started working um, now with, with showgirls, actually. So talking about business, um, you own your own business, you're independent. When so many uh, designers today are getting gobbled up by the luxury groups, um, are you happy to stay independent? Uh, how, uh, yes, I am very happy to stay independent. I remember when, so when I first started, I had this friend working in the fashion industry, so I asked him his advice, and he said, listen, there are two ways when you start, when you start your company, you have two ways. Either you do with your possibilities and you stay in a cellar for 10 years and eventually after 10 years the head is coming out of the cellar. Or either you give a participation to people and then you know it's easier from the beginning and it gets whatever bigger or more important. So, well, you know, if you see that way, those two ways, who wants to stay in a cellar for 10 years for sure? But at the same time, I thought, and I know myself, being a bit spoiled, and I thought, well, basically, in a cellar, I'm not going to eat too much, I'm not going to go super fat, etc. You know, I'll, I'll concentrate on work. And anyway, independence is a thing for me which has always been important. So I thought, well, I'm going to go for the cellar. I'm sure they're all calling, though. And, um, and first of all, there hasn't, been, to... there hasn't been a cellar for 10 years. But also from the first day, I was so enthusiastic on my work that you never think about that. When you do what you love, But I think it's no amazing selling. that you have been able to um, sustain your business and be independent. I think it's a really big inspiration for a lot of young people who are starting their um, companies today to not... Um, I think if you focus on the product, and as you have, and on your customer, 
Um, it shows that actually you can run a sustainable business without the help of a big luxury company. But it does mean that um, one day, you know, when you're 99 years old, um, you may have to hand over. Do you, do you think about handing over to another designer in the house of Le Boutin? No, I don't. Would you close thinking. it down? You know, I don't think about that. It's, it seems very far. I um, know. No, no, I don't think about that. Don't talk to me about okay, that. Okay, all right. Um, so she wants me to be 99 tomorrow. <laughs> that is the idea. Um, then you'll start de designing lower-heeled shoes. Um, oh, this is a, a question that a lot of people ask me um, when they knew I was going to talk to you, which is, um, do you think that the brand would have been as successful without the famous Red Soul? I think that, you know, the importance of the Red Soul is it's clear. It's been my signature, and I think that uh, in the fashion industry, when you have signatures, sign of recognition, it's almost like a childish thing for people. It's a lot of fun to sort of recognize through things. It's almost like a game. So definitely, the, my signature has been important. But you know, once it's done, you know, people are watching the design, and I'm concentrating on the design. So it's a thing which has been done one time. I don't, and I never think about it anymore. Do you, do you guys know how the red soul came about? Do you want to tell them how, how you did it? You want me? It's a famous story, but go ahead, Christian. I mean, because it's such um, an amazing moment. I, um, my third collection, I was designing, uh, first of all, I always draw. I draw a lot. And so I was drawing, and um, all the drawing were with really bright colors, vivid colors. And I was thinking a lot pop art, Andy Warhol, the serigraphy, the watercolors, etc. So everything was really bright, 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 and vivid colors. And the thing when you go to factories, the first prototype in general are going to be destroyed because it's never really correct, etc. So of course the factory take a bad skin, horrible colors that they want to get rid of for the first prototype. But as this collection for me was so about colors, I specified I'm going to, once I'm designing the heels, the points, etc., I really want you to follow the colors also because I want to be able to concentrate on the line. And, but if I see those horrible colors, it's going to be complicated for me. So there was instruction on colors. And, and if you ask to any designer, you know, when, when you're drawing, one thing which is very exciting is when you are as close as possible from your primary design because of course, it is a drawing, a sketch is only a sketch. You know, there is a reality which transforms your sketch from the beginning. But there is a huge excitement to leave your sketch as close as possible of your, your first sketch. So this time I was very happy. It was not deformed. It was exact. It was a new heel en trèfle, comme ça. So the heel was the perfect proportion with the front, with the Mary Jane, and it was this big flower. It was a Mary Jane with a big round flower. Um, so I looked at it and I thought, well, that's exactly, that's really, that's really the drawing, that's really, there is nothing to change. I mean, I tried it on, it was even working, I couldn't believe it. But, but still, I was looking at the drawing and something was, and I had the shoe and I had the drawing and something was better. So I thought, what is that, that it's not on the drawing? Something is missing, but I, I couldn't see what was missing. And turning the shoe, suddenly I had this big mass of black which was the soul, which was not on my drawing. And I thought, well, could it be that? Unfortunately, the girl who was drawing on the shoe, Sarah, was painting her nails. So I grabbed her nail polish, and she started screaming. I said, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I don't have another one. We're in Italy in the middle of nowhere. What am I doing? I said, listen, it's fine. I'll get you another one. So I painted the, the, the soul, and it just like um, a revelator, like a transformer. Yeah. Was it, it this color? It was this color. It was this color, absolutely. So if she'd had yellow nail polish or gray, as everyone's wearing today? Uh... I don't think so, because at the very beginning, uh, when I painted the soul in red, I thought, well, that's great, and I'm going to do a color per season. But then immediately, two things happened. Um, immediately, it became really strong with the red. The red goes with a lot of things, but also, it was 92, and a lot of women didn't wear colors. But even if you don't like colors, 
you end up having red elements, the nails, the lips. You have a lot of red, even if you don't think color, you have red elements. Do you think it's crazy that no one else has done what you had done? I mean, it's just one of those branding decisions, which was obviously it came from a place of you wanting to perfect the design, but it's amazing that no one else had thought of it. <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, at the same time that this happened, what happened is that, so I was, the first year I was selling, when I was not in Italy, I was also a salesman in my shop, in my first shop. And Were you a good salesman? I was a very good salesman. I was pretty good. Try, I liked sell it. Sell me some shoes. What? Sell me some shoes. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so what happened is that so there was this couple which, uh, who, who arrived. They, uh, two people arrived, the couple. And, and the man was in his 50s and the woman was also in her 50s. Beautiful couple, Brazilian. And, um, and the girl who was selling in the shop with me was looking at the man with those big eyes. And so the girl was trying on the shoes and then when they left before, the man was looking at the shoe and looking like this, like that, just men do, you know, just looking at an object. And then he returned, so there was just his soul, black, you know, Vero Coyo, real leather, etc. And he put it back, there was nothing special on the soul, he put it back. And they left, and the girl said, Sarah said, I wish I had put my phone number on the back of the soul. So I thought, that's funny, I've been painting that soul red. And she says, this one says, there should be a number. So yeah. I thought really a soul is like a message. And also if you cross a woman in the street, for instance, and she goes this way, you return, one thing you would remember is really like a signal. Yeah, but I love that you're looking at their shoes. Most men are not looking at their shoes. Well, <laughs> it changed. <laughs> OK, so speaking of looking at shoes, um, let's talk about shoes and sex. Go. Okay. <laughs> so you have said you really need to be a criminal or a pervert to shock me. Okay. True. Um, you've been inspired um, by music hall, cabaret. You talk about the bedroom and shoes and the significance. Um, can you be sexy and wear bad shoes? Yes. 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 Of course. Okay. It's too sad, but yes. yes. <laughs> Can wearing Christian Louboutin shoes make any woman sexy? Well, I think that, I'm going to tell you one thing from that. One time I was in, again, my shop. I'm often there, you know, the office is next to it also. And this woman, I arrived and there was those three women sitting together, sort of having fun actually. And one was barefoot and she tried on a pair of high heels, the very privé. And she looked at herself and she had this big smile and she started to speak, she was Spanish, she started to speak in Spanish, say, mira, mira, and something in Spanish which I don't understand. And the third one was American, so she said, what are you saying? And so they say in English to the third friend, they say, well, look, I look so great, I'm completely transformed and it's much cheaper than a facelift, and they started <laughs> laughing. So there is this transformation. It's not cheaper than a facelift. <laughs> Got a bad face. Yeah. So. And there is this transformation. There is definitely this transformation. Again, what was the question, actually? Oh, yes. can, can a woman, uh, can any woman be sexy in Louboutin shoes? Yes. If she pleases herself, yes, because, you know, sexy is coming from an attitude, you know. You need to sort of please yourself to feel sexy in a way. So, yes, absolutely. If you like yourself, yes. You've said that um, you know what women want. What do they want? <laughs> you don't want to know again. <laughs> I know, no, I'm just no. checking to see if you know. <laughs> no, you know, what, what I mean by that is that I was um, brought up in a feminine environment. Yeah. I had three sisters and I, we added another one, which is not a blood sister, but which, who was very important to me because she arrived and she was closer in terms of age. But women, when there is no men around, are behaving in a very different way than when there is a man. But as a child, as I was a little boy, I was not considered by my sisters as a male element. So I could, just like, you know, in front of a play, I could actually hear and I would see what women are when they are not with a man, you know, with a male element. 
And I was always shocked that the behavior of my sister would become completely different if there was my father or if there was a man in general. And I never thought, well, they lie in one way or another. I just thought women are that way when they are together. And when there is a man, there is a transformation. You know, it's, men are different when there is no woman. It's the same way, in a way. And so that's what I mean. I've been seeing and noticing a lot of things that most men haven't seen because I was not considered as a man because I was so little. Lucky you. Um, yes, that was a lot of fun, actually. So these are the, <laughs> there's some interesting um, things that you talk about with shoes and possibly the, the shoe fetish, fetishists um, are all up on this. But tell, tell, tell us about the importance of toe cleavage. Ah, okay. Now, I, uh, I always loved low cleavage, and one of the reasons is it makes a longer leg. Okay. And also, when I studied with the showgirls, the showgirls are very specific with their shoes. Number one, you know, they need to be able to dance, they need a good balance, but they want the longest legs possible. And basically, from, and they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, they really know what they're talking about. So when you look at the showgirl, when she is looked, basically, they know that you calculate the length of the leg from where they start to have the, whatever the stocking, the spacqua, the first mm -hmm. the thing, here. In general, it's not here. In general, it goes there. And till the front of the décolleté. So visually, you calculate that leg from len, in French, to the tip of the shoe, the décolleté. So if you have a very high décolleté, basically it sort of closed the window. If you do the décolleté lower, it opens the window, so it opens the legs on it. So and that's why you always do a much shorter toe. Absolutely. And also there is an element which is a little bit, I realize, a little bit shocking for a lot of women at the beginning. It sort of is a little bit less like that now. But I remember, that's actually very French. I always did low cleavage, and a lot of women would be like, this is a bit disgusting. I say, what? I say, I can see the front of my toe. I look naked. I say, but if you have a sandal, you're even more naked. Right. They say, yeah, but it's different. And I realize that also the cleavage, it actually carries the name of the first cleavage being here, and the second cleavage being the crack, I think you say. And I didn't say that, but yes. Voilà. And, uh, but definitely the décolleté is another cleavage. And what people see is actually really the crack of the ass, but in front of them, you know. And so there is an element which is a little bit shocking and which you can play with. But it's, yes, you have free cleavage, basically. And hence the longer legs. Um, Let's see, we're running short on time. Um, all of these things we've covered. Oh, and this was asked um, from someone who cannot buy your shoes. What advice would you give a woman who can't afford your shoes? I had to go somewhere else. Not to, you know, to, <laughs> to, she doesn't have to stay bare feet. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we open it up to the, the, the floor, um, I'm just going to ask you a series of quick questions, and you can just answer with one word or, or abstain from answering. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite color? Red. <laughs> what's your favorite thing to do? Working. Designing. It's good for us. What's your favorite quality in a person? Favorite? Um, Favorite quality? In a person. Oh, there is a lot. But uh, one thing which would come to my mind is enthusiasm, I would say. And um, in English, it's complicated. But, uh, but also to tolerance, I tolerance. would say. Mm -hmm. But I would say the opposite. I hate intolerance. <laughs> what do you wish um, you could do over, if you had anything to do over? What does it mean, do over? Uh, de changer quelque chose. In me? No, dans la vie. Well, I guess injustice. What do you find yourself doing that you said you would never do? Cooking. I should really start <laughs> trying. 
Okay. I'm obsessive, so I'm obsessive. So when you cook, you should not be obsessive. I mean, this friend of mine said, "Listen, lemon on omelets, you have to stop." Oh my God. <laughs> and I think he's right. Um, what's your nickname? I have a lot. Okay. I have uh, Lapero, which is like a little rabbit. Don't ask me why. I have Luby. Mm -hmm. I have Botinos, which I hate. And I have Los Botinos, which I hate. Also. Los Botinos. <laughs> <laughs> these are all, everyone's registering these Twitter handles right now. Um, OK, this is, what is your porn name? Do you know what a porn name is? No. So this is the name of your first pet and the name of your, mo your mother's maiden name put together. First pet? Yeah, like animal, like a dog or a cat. What was that called? And then you put the name of your mother's maiden name. What is that? I don't, I don't it's understand. your porn name. Porn name yeah. is the name of a cat with it's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mine yes. is Minnie Jones. Minnie Jones? Yeah. So you have a cat which is called, called Minnie. Minnie. My first animal is called Minnie, and my mother's maiden name is Jones. So. First of all, being French, we don't have middle names. Maiden. What uh, is maiden? It's son nom de jeune fille. Ah, okay. Alors, it would be... But I never had pets. <laughs> okay, what's the maiden name? Guérin. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> what scares you? Questions about porn names. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to say something very shocking. Okay. The only difference between men and women, meaning women driving. That's that really scares different. you? That's the only difference between men and women. The real difference <laughs> is women driving. Oh my god, we're, we're really good multitaskers, okay? <laughs> On behalf of women drivers. Um, what's your favorite word? Escalope. Escalope? <laughs> <laughs> what turns you on? Many things. What turns you off? Clogs. Clogs? <laughs> when you end up at the pearly gates in front of God in heaven, what would you like to hear him say or she say? Are you happy to be back? <laughs> I love that. Um, any addictions? Um, yes, actually, I had one that I realized that I had one, but I don't remember which one. <laughs> I have an addiction. My phone, I have to say. And, but no, 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 I found that I had an addiction, but I don't remember. Okay. It must not be that no. terrible. No, you're okay. No, no. Heroes? Many heroes. You want one? One. No, no, it's like the best friend. It's complicated. Don't ask me for the best friend either. This is the Miami. Okay. What's the first thing that you think of when you wake up in the morning? Where is my phone? <laughs> <laughs> and what's most important in life? Freedom. And then finally, in two years' time, you're going to be 50? Ish? In three years' time. Three years' time. We're not rushing it. I don't want you to be 99. Um, what, what does it mean to you to turn 50? Half a decade? Uh, half a centenary? Well, I'm just going to see what's happening. And uh, I've always been sort of happy. When I was 12, I was happy to be 12. When I was 15, I was happy to be 15. When I was 20, I had no problem with 13 either, 14 either. So I don't see why 50 would be a different. I mean, you've been introduced by someone who seems to be 50 and who seems to have a great life, so I don't think there is any yeah. bad what No? Yeah. I, I can't say that I can't wait, but it's fine. Bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, finally, um, your mom, um, if she were here tonight, um, what would she say to you? So, she would be probably happy. She must be enormously proud. No, she would probably say, I have to learn English now. <laughs> Um, thank you, Christian. It's, um, I'm going to get you for asking me to do this. <laughs> and um, I guess join, join me in thanking Christian for being here tonight. Wasn't she nice? <laughs>